This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. And WordPress.com. Right now, WordPress is offering you 15% off any new plan purchase. To create your small business website today, visit wordpress.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. Yes, at Jason on Twitter. And we are very happy to announce today that we are live on Twitter Live. So thanks to our friends over at Twitter. Jack, thank you. Uh, oh, by the way, Jack, my name is Jason Calacanis. We met about 18 times. Uh, he didn't remember the last time I met him. He was, <laughs> it was a pretty funny moment. Um, <laughs> So today on the program, everybody's favorite, Molly Wood, is back. She is the host of Marketplace Tech. Welcome back to the program for your 27th appearance. Thank you. I like and, that everybody's favorite business. Yeah, well, people, <laughs> I always get a lot of, like, bring more Molly. Everybody Aww. wants more Molly. Yeah, well, that was just Burning Man. But uh, also here <laughs> on the show, more Molly. <laughs> but I'm bump. bumped. Yeah. Uh, did you burn this year? I did not burn. Have you burned? I've never burned. So... Which do, I feel like disqualifies me Do you feel you will burn in the future? From tech. From Silicon Valley, yeah. Uh, do you intend to burn in the future? Uh, I, I'm not going to lie. I don't really want to burn, but I also am increasingly feeling that burning is unavoidable. It is as unavoidable. As like a professional duty. Exactly. I'm also not one of the burners. Yeah. All right. And our, uh, for the first time... Sarah Fryer is here, just like Fryer Tuck is how you pronounce your last name, correct? Fryer, uh, F-R-I-E-R. You can follow her on the Twitter as well, Sarah with an H and F-R-I-E-R. She is a technology reporter for Bloomberg News. You can follow them. They're at business on the Twitter since this is a Twitter uh, festival and joy and love for Twitter finally getting us on the Twitter live with over 200 people watching. We're going to talk about a lot of things today, including the iPhone X and will you pay $1,000 for a new phone and is the best that Apple can do talking poop emojis. Facebook seems to have run Russian ads and helped Russia interfere with the election, and they are in hot water about it, and they refuse to release the racist, bigoted, anti-gay, anti-black ads that they run and they approve to run that were paid for by the Russians. This is all coming out in the past week. Additionally, the bropocalypse continues with SoFi CEO resigning among multiple sexual harassment scandals. This is just never going to end. Uh, Bodega, two ex-Googlers, have made headlines for their tone-deaf launch using the name Bodega to put bodegas, which are basically in Brooklyn, we call them delis, like corner delis, uh, they're trying to put those out of business, so they decided to <laughs> co-opt their name to do that. And um, some of the uh, some more news on influencers and how social uh, companies are making money off them or stopping them, and how tech hasn't kept kept up with food stamp users' needs. Something we should talk about. Bitcoin's been banned in China, and uh, Tesla had uh, nothing to do with the fatal autopilot crash, but. They lacked safeguards, an NTSB report out. Nestle's acquired Blue Bottle, which is loved by hipsters here in San Francisco and probably loathed by the rest of the country. And apparently Google wants to invest in Lyft after having invested in Uber, which is always a bad look, but they're obviously in a big fight with them. Let's start with the iPhone X. I'm assuming you both uh, watched the keynote or uh, at least read up on it afterwards, Molly. Thoughts on the $1,000 phone. Is this something that is going to be a non-issue, or do you think people are actually going to not buy based on it being so expensive? Or is an extra two or 300 bucks for a phone de minimis compared to the value we all get from our phones? It's 50 cents more a day over a two-year lifespan. Yeah. I do people care or not? I will tell you that I've gone back and forth on this in my mind many times because I do think that smartphone pricing... There's an argument to be made that it's gotten super out of hand. At the same time, the iPhone 10, the 10, the 10, like OS 10. I can't call it X, even though there's an X, which I really should have seen coming in retrospect. <laughs> I was like, right, OS 10, iPhone 10. Yeah, the 10th anniversary. I get it. Yeah, 10th anniversary. Although also, I, nine is kind of like, eh, I could skip the nine. Yeah, don't do nine. But iPhone uh, X nine, I'll wait sounds kind of cooler to me X is than much iPhone cooler. 10. Like it, it sounds sound cooler. cooler. Like it SpaceX, Professor X. Professor yeah. X. Yeah. I Don't think lie. they're biffing it. I really do, which is a, a larger theme. I think after having seen some of the benchmarks for this phone um, and watching what Apple's doing, which is essentially create a super premium category within their already premium lines, right? Genius. They've done it with the MacBook. Like the, they, they refreshed all the MacBooks and then they did the really fancy one that had USB-C. I mean, it's for people who are 
what they're kind of doing is this very clever mini Microsoft strategy where they have backwards compatibility right. with an iPhone 8 that works just like and looks identical to the one that you have been using since the 6. Uh, so it's not very scary. Mm-hmm. But for people who are super fans and who are willing to learn new things and learn new behaviors and pay more money, then they have this sort of other line of goods and and like Hermes watch bands. And, you know, I mean, they, right. they're clearly sort of creating a new strata within their product lines, which I think is really interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, and then that said... As much as it pains me to admit it, I think the phone is worth a thousand dollars. It's oh. faster than a MacBook. Did you see some of the benchmarks? It's faster it's than really, a MacBook Pro. It's it's really incredible. But I think I think people who worry about this thousand dollar price point, mm-hmm. you know, it's just going to push people to the monthly payment installment plans exactly. a lot more. Because what's a few more bucks a month? It's like one day that you don't take an Uber. Yep. Um, whoa, it, whoa, whoa, <laughs> whoa! He's on the one day not taking. What you mean is it's one a lot of less days. blue bottle coffee. One less blue bottle coffee. Please, please. let's be careful uh, here. <laughs> Don't mess with my money. <laughs> Keep going, Sarah. But, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where you're like, I could afford five, ten bucks yeah. more a month. And then you can, you know, make this work in a non-premium tier as well. For people who are just so attached to their iPhones because it's just part of their whole ecosystem. Yep. I mean, it's, it has been for years. It's very expensive, but it's true that the way that we buy phones in the U.S. W- the day of the announcement, the one thing that I, the one thing I think is interesting is that they're they're in some ways pricing themselves out of China. That's a good point. And that this is, doesn't apply. That argument doesn't apply to international. Right, because we yeah. buy phones in a totally different way in the U.S. We don't pay for them. We pay for them monthly. We get them highly yeah. subsidized by carriers. Contracts. And that is not a. A uh, common model, and that's not a model that uh, that exists within, let's say, the Chinese middle class. However, I was looking at the Apple website and noticed that because you know their their model has or their their strategy has always been we have a new thing, so the old thing never existed. We were always at war with Oceana, right? It's like right. the old models completely disappear, and you can't buy them anymore. But if you look at the Apple Store now, they are still actively selling iPhone models all the way back to the six. In, and then including the iPhone SE. So if you really looked at their entire line, they've got a ton of iPhones for sale at a ton of different price points. Doesn't that just make it more confusing for customers, yeah, though? Like, it's a hot mess. This is not the Steve Jobs simplicity. This is this is a, a lot of different tiers, a lot of different options. Yeah. Okay. What what are you each rocking over there? You got sevens, sixes, or seven? Seven plus. Seven, seven plus, plus for mm-hmm. me too. Seven plus of all around. Do the black one. Because I have the piano. yeah, it's the black one. Yeah. With the, now, when the we case bought off. the seven plus, we all thought. Correct me if I'm wrong. Seems like a minor upgrade. Doesn't feel like there's anything that new in it. But I was really mad about the headphone thing. Still really on. mad about the headphone thing. But then I have to say, I was absolutely delighted with the purchase when I started taking pictures. Yeah, the camera is so much better on the Seven Plus. That's all that matters to me. Mm-hmm. Is it? Is it? Mm-hmm. All that is the is the camera. That's the only that's good that great. That's the great feature. The portrait mode is great. I mean, the portrait are, mode. If you amazing. have dogs or kids, is amazing. I take pictures. My wife saw pictures that we took with the portrait mode, which blurs the background like a hipster photo and makes the face crystal clear. She immediately went that week to get upgraded because she was like, I don't want you to be taking better photos than me of our children. I need to like go get this better phone. So <laughs> my question my to game. you both is, the phone was a clear upgrade. I loved AirPods. I think it's the best product they've made in a mm-hmm. long time. I'm, I'm never, no. What, what do you mean? Do you realize that. that these connect immediately and instantly to all your devices without ever touching the Bluetooth nonsense? You do, have you tried them? Mm-mm. Oh my God, Molly, I'm I so know, disappointed. I you ha- I'm going to. All right, uh, Emmy Award Ring We're producer. We're not going to share Nate. yours. I'm not obviously. a, not a no, no, headphones for person. Obvious Emmy Award Ring producer Jackie, please take a note. Uh, send Molly a pair of AirPods <laughs> as a thank you <laughs> so for being on the show 27 together. times. Uh, will, you in, will you each upgrade to the 8 or the X slash 10? Which one will you each upgrade to and when? And how will you make that I, I decision? Look, it's like Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah, I have to look you know into when my, my 18 month payment plan runs out because I don't want to overpay for this one. Right. So I got to upgrade. So but you're going to wait for the upgrade cycle. I'm going to wait for, for my time to be up. Yep. And then will you go eight or X? Oh, you know, it's, it's hard. I probably the X. You're going to go X. Probably yeah. the X. And now you're going to go X because it has all these extra features, wireless charging, the screen goes to the border and it's got the faster processor and better camera. Is that the reason or because you just don't want to be seen with an eight? <laughs> 
<laughs> not so much about what, That's I, what they've done what with I'm the eight seen now. with. Yeah, I I th- I think it's it's all about the camera for me and the mm. the the photo effects. I mean, I'm not a big uh, Instagram influencer or anything, but I I really enjoy making things look pretty. Um, yeah. Okay. I, <laughs> I like to travel, so I like having a good camera. For sure. Okay, Molly, take me through your decision-making process. Will you upgrade before your time in your plan, or you wait and be frugal and then make, and then when you do have that, which one will you choose? I mean, I'm definitely going to wait and be frugal Okay. because I work in public radio. But also right. because there's just no, I mean, there isn't, even the 10, even as fast and nice and wonderful as it is and with the whole the screen and whatever, yeah. for one thing, it's probably going to be back-ordered until my co- my right. payment contract <laughs> yeah. is up. So a fair point. that makes it pretty easy. But no, I mean, for me, the upgrade cycle with the iPhone is sort of like Stockholm Syndrome. I, I would love for there to be another alternative for me, but there won't be. And this phone will start to crap out right around the time. That, and Perfect. that's how I ended up with the 7 Plus as I was on a uh, 6 and or a six plus, and it just started to give out. It just started to crap out, and on the like perfectly timed schedule that they have. And I was in Montana, and it's, I went into a, a Verizon store, and I was like, "You know, because nobody had the damn phone, so I couldn't yeah. even upgrade, even though my six plus was dying." Anyway, all that said, yes, get the ten. It's probably going to have first generation issues and be annoying, but it's sort of like buying all the house you can buy. Like, why would you not get the best one? Of course, and I. I think the cameras are going to be the same in the 8 and the X. I'm not sure. I know the facial recognition stuff is in the... Is that in both? Do you know if the facial recognition is in both? Emmy Award producer, feel Jackie, like it's in check both? that up. I feel like I it's in know. both. Um, so <laughs> It doesn't really matter. But you, I mean, you made the joke about working for public radio or whatever, but the truth is, yeah, face ID is X only, to be clear. So right. if you want to have the, your face recognized. Now, what do you guys think of that feature? Is that something that... The touch when you use your thumbprint, that's instant. Do you, do you want to sit there and make your face do a big circle in order to unlock your phone? I don't. Yeah, those features for me are dead on arrival unless they work perfectly every single time. Which they didn't. And it failed in the demo. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's first it, generation hardware. If somebody hardware. Just, like, takes your phone and points it at you, then that it yeah. could open. It could open. I, I, don't, I, I mean, it can't be the only way into the phone. And I, I don't, it would have to be pretty, because even the touch is not perfect. It doesn't always work every no. time. And it's so, you know, and so. If it gets it's a little so much moist, better it than it was work. in the beginning. Yeah. And that's what I think is going to happen with this is like when I had my first touch phone, yeah. it was so One useless. out of three, yeah. So yeah. useless. But now it's very, very easy. It's crisp, yeah. Yeah. I, it's going to probably take time. Yeah. I like the idea of it being, I want to have the option on my phone to have it be facial recognition, the thumbprint, and put in a four-digit pin. Me too. I want all of that. I want to check off all three. Yep. Because I know these things can be hacked. And this idea that we're going to rely on one thing, like a biometric or your face scan, which I guess is a biometric, it falls in that category, um, it just feels to me like it's too light, the security. Now, what do you think of the security issues of them having your face and video of your face stored every time, and it's kind of weird, no? Well, they said they're not going to store it, I think. They yeah. sort of made it a specific point of saying that there would be some security around that, but I think that you're going to see in the coming months a lot more conversation about facial recognition. You're starting to see it already because yeah. it's being you know, widely used for uh, surveillance and, and law enforcement. You're starting to see you know, databases of, I mean, Facebook's got an absurdly large Facebook database. Facebook already has all, yeah, all that data for your... You know, they can recognize Everything. somebody in in the corner of a picture. Of, yeah. You know, and a no few one's steps away, you really can tell who it is. That. No one's talking and, about that database. And I think you know, this is not going to be as big of an issue for Apple because they don't advertise off the information they have, um, the way that Facebook does, the way that Google might. Um, There's no of, financial all incentive of these companies, for them. Yeah, all of these companies um, that are building home assistants are are going to have so much more information about you or, or at least information on the same level. Yeah. Uh, and Amazon's starting to get into advertising. I mean, it's getting very, um, very interesting. Scary. I, I think it's getting a little bit scary. Any of these systems that can be hacked will be hacked. In fact, one of the companies, I'm an investor in Butterfly, introduced facial recognition for your home camera. So you open up the app and you see all the people that your home camera caught because I have them around the compound and like we're getting pictures of people. I was like, oh, that's the gardener. Oh, that's the guy who installed the TV. So literally I clicked on the person uh, who installed the TV, like the AV guy, and I put AV guy and gardener. Mm -hmm. Now when somebody comes to the house, if the AV guy comes to the house, I get an alert on my phone, AV guy's in the house. 
gardeners wow. in the house. Wow. Like, start thinking about that. It's not just like movement or sound. It's like this dog, Taurus, and this dog, Fondue, is in this room. Right. I mean, it's really well, powerful. And, and then play that. dog, Fondue. But play that <laughs> yeah, ahead. Dogs, that awesome. yeah. Play that ahead to Jason is on Market Street. You know, oh, it's coming. Sarah is on Taylor. Sarah's yeah. at the WeWork office. I mean, that's all that's all coming. So I think all the conversations about facial mapping and facial recognition, like that conversation just needs to keep happening. And the facial recognition is so good now. That I saw somebody was uh, looking at the Antifa folks uh, in these riots or whatever has been going on. Yep. And just generally people who are masked at riots. It's not just an Antifa thing. Um, and they said they can, I don't know what percentage it was, but some very high percentage with a bandana and a hat on, just from the eyes, mm -hmm. they were had very high that. accuracy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think you're going to have to wear a full-on mask when you're walking down Market Street going forward. We're all going to just be wearing Well, in the data thing, this is, I know I'm prolonging this conversation, but did you see that crazy story about how they trained a machine to recognize from fa from facial characteristics alone, mm -hmm. the, the AI was able to predict someone's sexuality, whether or not they were gay. And they had put in no data set around like, oh, you know, gay people usually look like this or not. But... So they wow. had not trained it. Wait, are you for, saying wasn't that uh, there was some dispute of that study? There was some dispute of the study. Yeah. yeah. So in the study they released, mm -hmm. they said that they were able to be accurate with, like eighty six percent of the time with men and some much smaller percentage of the time with women, or relatively smaller. Um, there were questions about the the veracity. What they're yeah. saying of is the gaydar data is real and AI has it. But they are suggesting that AI could have data could have gaydar, but also false positives. I mean, so what? So the questions like that machines will be. That's what the I keep data telling that my it'll wife. be deriving well, from your face. It's like, like, this is a mistake. These Maybe guys not. are just, their gate art's totally off. Maybe not. The gate art's not off. Um, it, that is fascinating. <laughs> anyway, it's really, it's really interesting, but it also is sort of like, look, if there's even more data that can be derived from facial recognition, whether you wear makeup, I mean, all of that can be used for targeted advertising. Like, it just goes on and on. We're getting it goes to on and on. It goes on and on and on. And it's, uh, we're getting to the ultimate, which is, Precognition from Minority Report, which is, can we actually study somebody's behavior online or video, et cetera, and determine if they're going to commit a crime? Yeah. That, it seems to me that somebody who's about to carry out a terrorist activity or shoot up a school, or God forbid, whatever, drive a bus into a crowd, I'm going to guess that they have certain facial characteristics that a computer will be able to pick up on. In other words, if the hijackers from 9-11 all went through... Uh, and we had AI of just 100,000 people who went through security, and you put the facial characteristics of the 19 hijackers, I bet we could find out some trait amongst them that would make them more likely. So if that's the case... Right, just micro-expressions, maybe. We're yes. now or facial movement. Yeah, it's not facial characteristics, it's movement. Screened. Well, and that's the other thing, exactly. The false positive stuff is just as... And, and then the noteworthy. other aspect of this, which we're going to talk about later today, is uh, what are the tech companies' responsibility to helping the government solve these issues, right? All right. Perfect segue, Sarah. Smooth. You're doing well on your first appearance here because that <laughs> is a great teaser before I go to an ad. When we get back, we're going to talk about the responsibility of uh, companies like Facebook and Google. And Facebook is failing hard on their responsibility, refusing to release the advertisements that they ran for essentially the Russians. Okay, hey, let me give a quick thank you to my friend Scott Walker. Walker Corporate Law is a boutique law firm and one of the oldest partners and sponsors of This Week in Startups. They specialize in representing entrepreneurs and startups and they encourage fixed fees, which means they will not scare you when you get that bill from your attorney every month. You're going to know what you're going to spend ahead of time. Super important for startup companies. They believe billable hours reward inefficiency. And their lawyers all have decades of experience, 10, 20, 30 years. No junior associates learning on the job with your startup. They do things like acquisitions and mergers, licensing, terms of service, privacy policies. And Scott Walker is a true mensch. He is, comes to all of our events. He gives tons and tons and tons of his time for free to startups to help them grow. He is passionate about startup companies and entrepreneurs. Give him a call, 415-979-9998-415. You know it's San Francisco. So just remember, 979-9998, 979-9998. Or email Scott at Walker Corporate Law. Scott at Walker Corporate Law. Or visit walkercorporatelaw.com. Thanks again to my friend Scott Walker, who is just a tremendous supporter of startups. Okay, let's talk about the ugliest story of the week. 
in my mind, uh, were the most, the most troubling on a long-term basis. Facebook, uh, it turns out, allowed Russian operatives to spend $100,000 on pre-election Facebook ads. They refused to release these ads. They were in private testimony in front of the Congress or Senate, I'm not sure which group. There seems to be four or five groups now interviewing people. Mm -hmm. It's hard to keep track of who's interviewing who. Uh, and in a, a ProPublica story that came out either last night or this morning, they found it was very easy to buy Facebook ads using hate speech keywords such as Jew haters. Additionally, I talked about this on the program. Can we queue up that video, uh, Jackie, of me talking about it with Kevin Rose a couple of months ago, and I'll play it for you. Yeah, yeah. it's possible. Okay, now, what if the Super PAC got their money in part through these $10 million, $20 million Russian consulting deals or apartment sales? What if the Russians stole databases of Americans that helped with the targeting at Cambridge Analytica that built a 250 million person database of Americans that's never been collected before. Do you have anything to back this up or is this just your Jason Bart analogy? I have a, I don't, I don't mean to get all uh, Alex uh, <laughs> Jones, but if you look at that series of observations and then add to that the observation of Zuck, Cheryl, and everybody at Facebook would not pick a side they didn't pick a side? They did not publicly come out for Hillary. Really? You cannot find one example of them coming, going out. They do, they, I'm sure they donated to Hillary. I'm sure they held fundraisers very quietly. They did not publicly go against Trump until after the election. And Zuckerberg just stood up to him over the Paris Climate Exchange. It's kind of the first time he's really stood up to him. Um, do you think that's because they kind of have to play the neutral card being Facebook? Right. So on a... I think that's exactly right. They probably said, as a platform, we can't be anything but neutral. But then Peter Thiel on the board was more than happy to give $3 million the week after the Trump Access Hollywood tape where he would, said he would grab people in a certain way or women in a certain way. So he had no shame about putting $3 million in. So we know that the money got spent. We know they did it through ads that were dishonest ads. We know it was to suppress a certain vote. Now what we don't know is what did Zuckerberg know? What did Facebook know about that money and the targeting? And that they let those ads so that were fake. Facebook will not release those ads. They have those ads. Okay. I wonder if the Congress or whatever. All right, so there you have it. Uh, so basically in that clip in June, I had inside information, or May or June, because I had people have been buzzing around it around Silicon Valley that Facebook and this Cambrian Analytica, mm -hmm. Cambrian Analytica had data on voters. Their speculation that they, did, they got some of that data from sources that would be described as Russian operatives. I don't have confirmation of this. But let's say that's a possibility. It seems like it's possible that if the Russians were willing to leak to WikiLeaks all of Hillary Clinton's emails, they might have voter rolls. But even if they don't have voter rolls, if Cambria and Analytica knows that these African-American voters in these states came out for Obama and we suppressed them, we could win those states. And Facebook has to manually review each ad. Anybody who's bought ads on Facebook knows they kick back uh, ads very easily. If you put a higher percentage than 10% of text over your image, they kick it back. If you link to a source, they kick it back. They don't allow porn ads. They don't allow gambling ads. They don't allow dating ads. Facebook has a long list of things that you're not allowed to do, and they manually review every ad. That's why there is a waiting period. It's not necessarily manual. It's, yeah. uh, it's a combination. Well, they have a first pass, which is what percentage of text is on the screen, and they obviously check links. But then all the other ads, especially a $100,000 ad buy, is manually reviewed. Do you think that they let a $100,000 ad buy go in without looking at it? Yeah. No. Really? No. Oh, I think Everything they absolutely did. They, they definitely saw these I ads. I think people overestimate the, the amount of insight Facebook has into the, the all of the activity that happens on its platform. I mean, $100,000 in the scheme of what was it, like 30 billion Facebook made from advertising last year, uh, could get lost in the mix. Hmm. So you, you, you actually think that nobody saw those ads? Oh, I, or that's I mean, possible? I, think, I think it's possible that people saw them, but maybe didn't, didn't raise alarm about them like they should have. But, right. um, but I also think it's possible that they, that they kind of 
fell into the mix of everything else that was happening. Okay, here we yeah, go. Let's run through this. Let's ads just run through this here. Facebook's I, business page. On this one. Before ads show up on Facebook, they're reviewed to make sure they meet our advertising policies. Typically, most ads are reviewed within 24 hours, although in some cases it may take longer. Here are three most common reasons why ads don't pass our review. Too much text in an image. That The reason they do that is because they don't want you to put something on the image that they can't do a semantic analysis of, mm -hmm. right? It's like a little bit of a hack. Age-restricted material, obviously they don't want uh, alcohol on there for young people. And then mentioning Facebook uh, is something they don't want you to do because they don't want you to confuse users. Uh, after your ad is reviewed, you'll receive uh, an email, blah, blah, blah. So those but are the guidelines. Is, this is a really procedural thing, right? right. You know, when, when people are going to review these ads, they're looking at those criteria and saying, does it meet these criteria? Mm -hmm. And and if it does, then it's fine. So, so they're not a lot of, um, you know, okay, well, maybe I should take an extra step to protect our democracy. I mean, there's not there's not a, a power of the, these ad right. reviewers perhaps to do that kind of thing. But Facebook refuses to release the ads, which to me is the ultimate tell. These ads are going to turn out to be so horrific and so obviously racist, bigoted, and insane that it is going to make them look just so horrible that it will send... Zuckerberg on a tour of America to meet with Americans individually in each state to apologize to them. Oh, wait, he's already started that. <laughs> Uh-oh, I broke democracy. Now what? I, I mean, if you broke democracy like this and you knew those ads, because you know they've seen the ads by now. Yeah. If you're Zuckerberg and you saw those ads and it said, you know, uh, and they did specifically ads that were anti-LGBT, mm -hmm. Uh, gun rights, gun race yeah. relations, race, like, all these very hot button issues. You know, Jason, what, what I think is perhaps even more interesting than what the ads say, since we already know it's going to be divisive, horrible stuff, mm -hmm. is the targeting. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, if this was targeted to certain states, do those states align with with uh, you know, the targeting that, well, they were, uh, but but are those the same states that a uh, campaign wanted to target? If so, how did Obviously. the information exchange go? Um, how did they know to, to target certain groups of people? And does that help lend any clarity? And I think that that's what the Mueller investigation is trying to get to. Uh, what a, a lot of senators want to know is if, if there was a sophistication to this effort, where did it come from? And, Cambrian Analytica. And in how did, well, but, but what we need sure. to... I mean, we, we, can, we can assume that Facebook, I mean, used its vast treasure troves of data and its really good algorithms when yeah. it comes to targeting to direct these ads where, where the ad buyers requested them to go. Um, it is, I think it's the lack of transparency around how all of that works yep. that makes it confusing. We actually don't, you cannot tell from that page, right? right? Whether, Basic I mean, I think ba I think we should assume that in most cases, robots are, are taking these orders, scanning these ads, and then sending them where they're supposed to be. That is absolutely what the ProPublica uh, thing, the investigation so like just found, the, the and Google did the same. The Facebook's advertising business, a lot of it it's is huge. a self-serve business. They can't even business. keep track of it. So a lot of people have asked me, like, well, who's, who's the salesperson at Facebook that approved this by, right? There's well, no person. Well, it's a, it's in a, a lot of cases, there are people, though. I mean, I, I can tell you for sure because we spend money on Facebook and Google and have, and many of my startups right. do, and they have reps there. And right, the reps will email you week be. after week after week. If you spend over five figures, you will have a rep, and that rep will email you constantly to get you to spend more. So in this case, you're wrong. But we also they, don't I know. know from a fact that you spend over that amount of money, you have a rep. Well, yeah, but what we know sure. is that they spent $100,000 on ads. We don't know if they spent them in $10,000 chunks. Oh, they could have spent them in $20 chunks. Or 5000 across 20 accounts. 5000 across well, 20 so accounts. Or if they spent 100 fake million. accounts and pages, right? Um, Most likely they went through, they used a version those of... Those pages mm, were paying to promote those people. right. I mean, most Those likely, so in this case, it's sort of like not carrying ten thousand dollars in cash, right? Like right. most likely, they went nine ninety nine ninety nine so that they could I I yeah, evade fly that detection. The radar. If and they then, wanted to fly under the radar, and BuzzFeed could. ran, hmm. you know, essentially the same uh, experiment on Google today on Google's ad platform to see if it could also buy if they could also buy hateful ads. And not only could How'd they, work? but the AI suggested even more hateful ads. <laughs> I mean, they were able to. Well, so did Facebook? Like, yeah, if, if you want to target, 
you know, do haters. You might also want to target people who, uh, you know, we know follow Hitler. Hitler like we, we know that you hate Jews. Right. What do you think of the blacks? Here's the <laughs> Hispanics. The, hate them too? <laughs> and so the real question is, like, does Facebook have any control? Do, do, at, of course at they what do. Point? No, no, no. I mean... N- Look, we've seen Facebook be pretty sloppy with its metrics and with its own. I mean, I was, at some I point, very. You're um, telling me the smartest kids in the room are sloppy. Come on. Yes. I was very surprised. The by guys who keep miscounting the, metrics and uh, having to give back money on video ads and yeah, those guys. Yeah. You think that's a mistake? I, I think it. I think when a system becomes sufficiently complex, it is impossible to know everything that's happening within oh that system. God. I don't and think it, it's and a Facebook mistake. has Keep has going. historically been very reactionary about these things, and they deal with them once people point them out, whether they knew about them already or not. Uh, of course, they they imply that they didn't. Um, but we've seen a lot of patterns like this. I mean, remember last year the trending topics debacle, yeah. right? Where Facebook was like, oh well, you know, of course there's no bias in that, but then they. You know, <laughs> then there was removed, yeah. removed the they the widget, and, the, and they they worked. Uh, they had invited conservative leaders to come to Facebook to to assuage their concerns. What I thought was really interesting um, was that last night the move that Facebook took to address this concern about being able to target Jew haters, for example, on their platform, is they blocked any targeting by job title or education, anything that people self-report. Mm. So that's actually really significant for Facebook's ad operation. Mm-hmm. Now you can't target Ivy League grads who play violin anymore because yeah. of... I have a feeling that's an easy concession for them to make. I think they want to know geography and age and interest. I think the college thing, probably people don't use that often because... Whether you went to college or not, most of the advertisers want to hit a certain demographic in a certain geographic location who like a certain thing. Right. True, do you think? I think. There's, let me ask this question. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Do you think it should be allowed for people to target by race on these networks? I.e., should you be able to target? Don't answer yet. Should you be able to target Hispanics versus Blacks, even if they self-report this is who they are? Do you think? these networks should be allowed to target by race when we get back on this week in startups. <gasps> oh. You stinker. Oh, oh, oh. oh, wait a second. I have to read the ad. Sorry about that. I thought we are cutting to an ad. Hey, everybody, let me just tell you how much I love WordPress. Matt Mullingweg, I've known him for, God, well over 10 years, and he has built what is the largest and greatest content management on the internet. 28% of all internet websites run on WordPress. It's by far the web's most popular popular and most powerful website building platform. That's why I use it for calacanis.com and why we use it here for this week in startups.com. If you're looking to create a personal blog or a business site or both, you can create that at wordpress.com and You will help people remember you, connect with you, follow you. You don't need any experience. You don't need to hire someone. That's a misnomer. You can go and just go to WordPress.com, and they will guide you through the entire process. They have hundreds of beautiful designs to choose from, built-in search engine optimization, social sharing, and every plan includes a free custom domain name. Business plans let you access hundreds of plugins and themes. There's a big developer community that supports WordPress. They're always adding new functionality, and you have access to expert-friendly support. So go ahead and visit WordPress.com. It is what I use for Calacanis.com and This Week in Startups.com. That's all you need to do. Here's your call to action. You'll get 15% off of any new purchase plan. Just go to WordPress.com slash twist, WordPress.com slash twist, and create your website and find the perfect plan for you. That's WordPress.com slash twist for 15% off your brand new website. Getting good at reading the ads. At NPR, you guys don't read the ads, right? American Radio, you're not allowed to read the ads? We do not read the ads, although we do in our podcast. It's sort of That's a, like a slightly different oh. underwriting arrangement. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So this has become a really interesting thing. Kara Swisher reads the ads. Mm-hmm. No one ever used to, ever. That ever. was like when we were coming up. Yeah. I mean, that was like the one thing. Remember the 90s? It was like, you do not touch the ads. The ads. The ads. Now you have journalists... Top journalist, me, you, Kara. Well, I'm not a journalist anymore. Reading the ads. I can tell you though that some, that w- there are lines. Like I've been in podcast recordings with Kai, where he's like, "I am not going to read this because I am not a pimp," and then we don't read that. Kai's like, "I am." Hopefully, wearing- Kai's not watching right now. He's like, "Oh come on." Hi, I'm Kai Rizal, and uh, I am wearing 
Mack welding underwear right now, and I can tell you it's fitting me snug as a rug, and a, that's about as far as I can go. All right, take us to the performance. Molly, what do we got? Is that a good Kai Risto? It's not great. It's not great. It's not Give not me great. your Kai Risto. Yours is good. <laughs> Give me a little Kai Risto. I can't do that. What if he's watching? Okay, nobody's looking. Go ahead, do your Kai Risto. You nobody's little... looking. How nobody's... many people are watching us on Twitter live <laughs> Just right now? Just like 200. Don't worry about it. You got a little Kai Risto. In Los Angeles, I'm Kai Risto. Kai. Yeah, you got totally. Kai. You got to bring in that Kai 500. Yeah, you got to bring in that Kai Risto 500. But now. Nice. World class. He's a world class broadcaster, yeah. you guys. I have nothing it's but love It's almost like country. He's almost got like a country He's twang. A little twang, yeah. He got a little twang in him. I know. That's many, interesting. Many influences are happening. Looking at the S and P one. <laughs> we can do this all day. You just, you just went Poor Sarah. <laughs> you went full Texas. Full Texas. I'm wearing my fries boots. Okay. How appropriate. Uh, all right. When I left our uh, amazing panel, Sarah and Molly, uh, Sarah, of course, is Sarah Fryer, F R I E R. And she is at Bloomberg News. You can follow them at Business. And Molly Wood is the host now of Marketplace Tech. Hey, somebody left Marketplace Tech, and now yes. it's all you. Yeah, Ben Johnson left Marketplace Tech. Thank you. Yes. It is very exciting. I am the host of my own national radio show. I have to tell myself that a lot because I work from home. <laughs> so pretty much like my kid and my dog still boss me around, and I'm in my jammies all the time. Hmm. So once in a while, I'm like, nope, turns out that's a big deal. Uh, it keeps happening to you. Like you just keep working, and then just like one crazy opportunity after another. It's where your your uh, hard work is paying off. Okay, Thanks, man. When we left, uh, I was talking a little bit about targeting. I've heard many different arguments about targeting people by race or ethnicity. I don't know what the political. Can you say race, ethnicity? What's a politically correct word today? I don't know. I wish they would just give me a just snowflake Bible. Can I get a snowflake <laughs> style guide? Jackie, is there a snowflake style guide I'm so sure I can stop is. triggering people? I'm sure that exists. Because I kept saying the third world. That's triggering. Oh, and now we have to say developing countries. Emerging markets. Emerging markets. For God's sake. Jesus. I missed a whole, like, a level. Molly, I'm really disappointed. <sighs> I know. I, I your micro look for my medium apology. Your medium. <laughs> I would like to afternoon. apologize for sorry the micro. <laughs> I'm sorry if I've, I'm sorry to anyone I may have inadvertently offended by using the term third world. By using the term, no, I said developing nations, which still, apparently still, is emerging markets. It's emerging markets. Still very, very microaggressive of you. <laughs> Should you be able to target Facebook ads or other ads by race and ethnicity? Yes. Yes. I I think there are a lot of good reasons to target by I, by race or an an ethnicity. Or well, right, and if makeup's one category, but what if there's like a scholarship for certain people, or mm -hmm. what if there's uh, resources? I mean, obviously, the problem is that these systems are all automated, and so nobody's making sure that, uh, as ProPublica put out in an earlier story this year, that they were uh, there were real estate listings where you could exclude black people from seeing those listings, right? right? You obviously don't want that. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can't hold violate the Fair Housing Act. Time. Did you not see that? That was so... That whoa, whoa, whoa. Was hold one. on a second. Say that one more time. Explain to me the story because I did not catch this story. Oh, oh yeah. This yes. is another pro -public, great ProPublica story on Facebook ads where they found that you could exclude certain ethnicities from seeing... Real estate <gasps> listing. Real estate listing. But in that case, so here's the thing. That is a violation of the Fair Housing Act. There right. is a law right. against that. Sure. So. So it's not about it's not necessarily about targeting by race. If we're going to allow targeting, you have to allow targeting by race because that is a, an important marketing category. However, I think the que the real question about Facebook is are we at an unprecedented point in Facebook's reach? Right? It's yeah. not it doesn't matter if it's some platform that nobody's on. This is <laughs> at one over in two six, billion users, I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. Right. When we're talking about one in six human beings on earth, then we may have to More take this than conversation. Half the internet connected population right. in the world. Well it's two point so one then, and three point three. So and then, so then that's not counting does, WhatsApp, it's not counting Instagram. So I think right. it's probably closer to three billion of the six of the I would say two point eight billion of three point three billion people online are on one of Facebook's platforms. Yeah. So then do we have to have a different conversation about how Facebook Book operates is yes. its business model a potential threat to national security? Obviously. Do they need to be regulated in a way that no company maybe ever has been? And, and Except you know, AT and T does is regulated like this. Like they may may have to but fall into law, utility the law category. Is very outdated with these election ads. Yes. If you advertise, you know this. If you advertise uh, uh, for an election on TV, mm. you have to submit that ad. You have to say exactly who paid for it. Uh, you have to say who you showed it to. Um, in what markets, 
that is so different than the rules for Facebook. Basically, Facebook doesn't have any election transparency rules. And you mentioned dark posting earlier. I mean, that's um, explain to what people dark. That's dark not ads are. really the the term that Facebook uses. They well, call that's them what we should use unpublished <laughs> page posts. Um, yeah, please, they're dark ads. Let's call it what it is. What it allows you to do is target people differently based on how you feel like the ad would re- resonate with them versus somebody else. That allows you to do some A-B testing. Or perhaps that you're so, the ad is so nefarious and ugly and disgusting that you don't want certain people to see it because they would screenshot it and say, oh my effing God, who on earth would allow an ad like this to run? That's a, a side symptom of, of I, I feel like when Facebook release his products, sometimes they think about them in the most optimistic terms. For example, live video. Mm -hmm. Grandmothers can finally see their grandchildren's first steps without having to be in the same state, right? That's a very powerful thing. Unfortunately, you can also see people get murdered live. Yeah. It's literally with natural born killers. I mean, if you're, I don't know if you remember the, the uh, natural born killers premise, but essentially Robert Downey Jr. plays like a whatever, like a uh, 60 Minutes or not even like a mm-hmm. more like a Access Hollywood type reporter who then gets hijacked to like live stream, essentially mm-hmm. live satellite feed it. All right, listen. The naivete is stunning. Well, the naivete is necessary to continue the business model. Well, And this is where, well, that's an astute point. You cannot take the smartest kids in the class, put them in charge of all this and then forgive them when it goes awry. These are the smartest people on the planet who built, they are. I mean, they may not, they may be fabulously naive and clueless at other times and socially awkward, but these are really smart people. I know them. These are people who would be in the top 10% of IQ test results. You can debate IQ test results all you want, but you can't debate that they're not in the top 10%. They hire based on this. They hire based on how smart people are, literally. So they're the smartest people in the world. They know the ramifications of what they're doing, and they specifically at Facebook do whatever it takes to grow the business independent of the impact on society. We saw it when they created groups, and they allowed anybody to add anybody to a group, and then some gay choir in middle America, the person who was running it, added everybody to the gay choir who were in college. You know what happened? About half of them hadn't come out to their families yet, and it posted on their wall, Jason's in the gay choir, and their parents are like, what? Why would Jason be in a gay choir? And it's like, oh, we have to have a really important discussion at Christmas. And you know what? People kill themselves over this kind of stuff. They at Facebook have a 20-year audit with the FTC for a reason. They're irresponsible. And now with great power of 3 billion people or whatever they've got, it's time for Facebook to grow up and stop behaving the way, Sarah, you point out, which is, let's be optimistic. I don't think they're optimistic. I think that they're marauding capitalists who want the thing to keep growing it has nothing to do with optimism. It has everything to do with share price. And if you're at Facebook, you should be ashamed of yourself. And this is a message to whoever has access to those ads at Facebook. It is your moral and ethical duty, in some people's opinion. Did you guys catch that disclaimer? Mm-hmm. In some people's opinion. In some people's opinion. You see yeah. that? That's not me saying it. In some people's opinion, it is the moral, ethical, what? Responsibility. Responsib- thank you, Molly. It is your moral, this is what some people say, not Molly or me Mm -mm. or Sarah, but some people say it is the moral responsibility, the ethical responsibility, the right thing to do for the Facebook employees who have access to these ads to leak them, specifically to Sarah and Molly. (laughs) If you hear my voice right now and you work at Facebook or you did work at Facebook, there are some people, not anybody in this room or on this podcast who's ever been here or who knows me, who believe that you should leak them right now to sarah.fryer at bloomberg.com. What's your email? sfryer1 at bloomberg.net. sfryer1 at bloomberg.net mm-hmm. and Molly Wood at? mwood at marketplace.org. And mwood at marketplace. If you were so inclined. If you were so inclined to leak these things and be a hero, you should leak these ads. And then Facebook, I will tell you right now, this is a message to Mark Zuckerberg, you are a complete and utter phony and do not deserve the responsibility of Facebook if you do not release those ads. It is unethical 
and it is immoral for you not to release the ads that could have compromised the democracy of the United States, which gave you the opportunity to become worth $50 billion, and for you to go out on a campaign across America to try to be more loved so that you can get political office while you allowed anti name a marginalized group ads on your platform and then refuse to let them be seen by the American people while letting them be seen by the racist, horrible human beings who would be attracted to those ads. You need to have your head examined and you are not fit for office, young man. <laughs> I don't mean to get all worked up about it, but I am infuriated not by the mistake, Sarah, you give them credit that maybe it was a mistake, maybe they didn't see them, Great, fine, give them the benefit of the doubt. But to not release them at this point in time when the democracy is on the line, and it's a whole nother thing to be a total coward, Mark, and not come out against Trump and to invite all these right-wing lunatics over your office and kowtow towards them so you don't marginalize, you, you don't lose anybody in your uh, platform. Fine, I understand. You're a marauding capitalist. You want Facebook to be for everybody. But to then not release these ads that compromised our democracy while having Peter Thiel on your board who donated millions to Trump after he said he assaulted women? Come on. What do you guys think of that? Where's, what do you think about Google? Where's Google sitting on this? Where does any company that's, I mean, well, I'll, I'll go down the line with them, but I don't know if anybody else ran ads like where's, this for the Russians. And I don't know if they let you target by, I know, I know for a fact Google doesn't let you target by race. Google does let you target by keyword. Yeah. And as they find keywords that are inappropriate, they take them out. Which is let's, let's talk a little bit about, about how Facebook's thinking has evolved here, um, because clearly they're not at the, at the stage of accepting full responsibility for everything. But, you know, last year they were saying, oh, we're just a platform. Whatever happens in society also happens on Facebook because we're just the place where people talk. That, that's just how the Internet is right and that's the same argument that you know reddit's given this we're just the place where humanity happens and you know we connect people and people are sometimes bad people uh but you know they're bad on facebook and but that has sort of changed as zuckerberg saw a lot of the isolationism and uh, polarization politically last year, he actually went and wrote this big uh, manifesto, uh, internally they call it Mark's Letter, uh, where he outlined how he feels the platform should be used differently. And I do think he's, he's attempting to understand uh, Facebook's effect on society. Um, and, and I think he's been... Maybe, maybe even surprised, uh, oh. because he's been a. a I think the company he's has surprised. been naive about the negative effects of oh. what they've done. I think mm -hmm. that's completely ridiculous that he would be surprised when he said that an election could not be swung by the internet, and he laughed about that. And everybody in Facebook pulled him aside and was like, "You can't you, say that Facebook is the perfect advertising medium for selling everything on the planet." and the perfect place to start a group, I don't, I and don't then at the same time say, but for one thing, elections, it doesn't work. No, they don't say it doesn't work for elections. He did, they, he did say that. Right, he right. did. And he backtracked that like... Right away, because Facebook has a political advertising sales pitch exactly. that says, you know, you can... You can, you can totally uh, swing the election. Yeah, they <laughs> said Facebook... You can target Hispanics in Florida and get them to change their opinion, you know. They and, sent They have team. case studies. Yeah, and they, they have case studies of switching people's votes, and they sent, according to this woman who wrote Trump's tweets, did you see that video? There's a woman who, who did Trump's tweets and everything, and they worked directly for the campaign, they said Facebook was at their offices. That Facebook reps were at their offices helping them craft messages. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's no there's no question that there is a deliberate naivete. That in some ways, Facebook this story is the natural result of marauding capitalism when the product also is built essentially on profoundly understanding the science of human addiction. You know, make sure that no one ever wants to get off your product. Yeah. Make sure that they want to spend engagement. their entire lives yeah. there, that they're constantly engaged, that all their friends are there, all their family is there, all their photos are there, everything they ever want to do is there, and then sell a bunch of ads against them. It is almost, and, and by the way, just be a monopolistic beast of buying every competitor and, you know, and engaging people more and more with more addictive behaviors. 
it is not, it shouldn't even really be a surprise that at that point that influence would be so strong. I don't, I don't think that it necessarily makes Mark Zuckerberg a bad human to be that kind of a capitalist. It's like that's what kind of capitalist everybody wants to be, right? No, no, no. I mean, no, I think no, I now, know. I think it's inexcusable to at some point then stand up and say, I have no responsibility for this. That's the issue I, I think have. that's, that's and I'm not sure that's really where grading still on, is. on people because when he goes to these different states and meets with people and has these conversations and then says, he has a post that says, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot of tension in our society over this <laughs> issue. Yeah, how could that ever happen? Um, he doesn't really say, well, and this is amplified on Facebook and... No responsibility. Right. There's he never takes any... zero responsibility. And it's like when he goes out on this weird listening tour, it's as though he's trying to understand... Uh, these odd humans. I mean, it just feels very, it comes from this place of, of r- roboticism and and an unwillingness to accept the responsibility for the, the thing that he built, the Frankenstein monster that he built that is now right. pretty out of control. He should really just say, listen. But he is this- never going to. Facebook needs to get regulated. Like this is yeah, not. Yeah, I think that's, that's they're not exactly going to regulate right. themselves. Facebook has shown itself to be untrustworthy so many times. Zuckerberg has personally shown himself to be untrustworthy with a huge swath of lawsuits in his younger years. I don't care how many cows he milks in these photos right. and how many photo ops he has. It does not take away from the fact that if you look at the early history of Facebook, it was built off of lawsuits and him screwing people over and over and over again from the Winklevoys, Winklevi to Eduardo to all of his partners. Mm-hmm. Fine. You want to be a hardcore capitalist with sharp elbows? That's fine. But then when you have 3 billion people, just take ownership of it and tell people, we screwed up. We allowed people to target ads in a way we didn't expect, or we should have read the ads more fine-tunely. And we are going to make the following uh, changes to the platform. So when you when you see Zuckerberg uh, talk on issues that he does seem to be very passionate about, like DACA, for example, you know he's in his first week of paternity leave, responding to commenters in the middle of the I night. Saw it, yeah. yeah. Do you think that that's uh, insincere, or do you think that 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 he's just a nuanced person? That Listen, ha- I, I haven't I haven't hung out. With, I've only hung out with Mark Zuckerberg three times, maybe in my life, and it was all during the first three or four years. You know, so I, mm-hmm. I don't know what Mark Zuckerberg at this age with two kids is like. I people mature, mm-hmm. so I'm sure he's matured phenomenally. And I would take him at his word that he believes that DACA, you know, is unbelievably cruel and insane to take a person who came here as, at one or two years old, three years old, and then kick them out when it wasn't even their choice to come here and, and destroy their lives. So I believe that, but I believe that he is not run Facebook in a way that is commensurate with the power and, and responsibility that he now has, which means if put in charge of the United States or California as governor, he has not behaved in an ethical and moral manner that would make me want to vote for him. And until you you take ownership. You believe that he's running. Of course he is. Eventually. Of course he is. Why would he have, why would he collude with Mark Andreessen to manipulate other board members secretly? You know about this lawsuit. Oh, I wrote that story. You wrote that story. <laughs> so, exp- <laughs> thank you. Explain to people the collusion of Mark Zuckerberg and Mark Andreessen to try to manipulate and trick other board members. Explain to the American public listening what that what happened there. It's so more basically, powerful coming from you because people think I'm a Zuckerberg hater. <laughs> so, so Zuckerberg has. Uh, He's wanted to do this reclassification of Facebook's stock so that he's able to, uh, basically, they're going to turn some shares that currently have voting power into a set that have voting power and a set that don't. And what that's going to allow Zuckerberg to do is sell shares without losing any voting control. And as part of this whole reclassification of, of uh, Facebook stock to give Zuckerberg power over the company in perpetuity, they sort of looked over the founder agreement again and made some adjustments. And one of the adjustments that they made was allowing Zuckerberg to ha- hold public office while still maintaining his control of Facebook. Hmm. Wow. I mean, this is, 
uh, but, setting I mean, aside Mark Zuckerberg, the person. Which was a sticking person, point in the board committee. And then the, yeah. the Andreessen portion of this. Andreessen was on the committee of three, uh, of three people within the board that was supposed to represent shareholder interests in the negotiations with Zuckerberg over the revised founder agreement. So, so Mark Zuckerberg's scenes, fiduciary responsibility this. was to the shareholders of Facebook, which include pensions and the American people, mm-hmm. and, Ma- and Mark Andreessen on this committee put aside his fiduciary responsibility to those uh, pension funds and shareholders who have their retirements and savings in Facebook stock and was SMSing with Mark. To try to coach him on how exactly to convince the committee that Andreessen was on that his changes were okay. So Mark Andreessen, would you consider this I mean, it's obviously a breach of fiduciary responsibility, correct? It's going to trial uh, in at the end of this month. Zuckerberg is, Zuckerberg is is expected to take the stand on September 26 to defend this. How is this in any way defensible, Molly? What defense could there possibly be for Mark Andreessen and Mark Zuckerberg to be SMSing with each other when they're on a committee to determine the future of the company and be manipulating the other two board members. Is there any defense of this that you can think of? I cannot. I, I, no, I, do, I would have to read a lot more about it to try to right. mount because this is the first I'm hearing of it. But I will say that, again, all of this, setting aside Mark Zuckerberg, the person, is the natural consequence of uh, out-of-control capitalism. I mean, look, it's not Facebook is the company we're talking about now. In the past, we've talked about Microsoft sure. and Bill Gates and his behavior. Uh, before that, maybe we talked about Ma Bell. Before that, there were robber barons sure. and this and that, right? Like, y- it. The question is, should businessmen be in be in charge? They've got such a he has such an inflated sense of himself. Clearly, right. I have solved all of these problems to make Facebook into the you know one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, so clearly, I am capable of solving societal problems too. Like we just shouldn't right. the buy that. The Facebook's poten- the maybe the the issues that Facebook has caused. The solution to that is. More Facebook. Right. More Facebook and more Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, that's, at the end of the day, it is just the arrogance of the tycoon all over again. Yeah. But in a less abrasive package, in this case. And it, it's just not, that's not how our government should be run. And then when companies get too big, they should be, regu- they are historically regulated and or broken up. And I think what we're seeing now is that Facebook is too big. Like, forget about Mark's ego, which is clearly a whole other probably foundationally the topic, Facebook is too big and has too much power. Do you agree, Sarah, that Facebook is too big, has too much power, and should be regulated, as Molly does? Well, I cover the company, so I hear both sides of this all the time. Um, take I, us through, take, take, instead of just your personal opinion, take us through the best argument on either side and then tell us your personal ooh. opinion as a human being. <laughs> uh, you want to get me in trouble? Um, no, I just—I mean, we, we're yeah. allowed to have opinions. It's, yeah. it's 2017. Journalists can have opinions. So, so I think on one side, it's that the company—the company feels that they're they're a reflection of society, like I, like I said earlier, and that that okay, if what they've done has caused these problems, maybe they can find a solution, and and you know make it easier for people to have empathy for each other. I mean, that's, that's the company's argument for this new mission statement that they introduced this year. Uh, they're changing it from connecting the world, because that didn't get to the conclusion that Zuckerberg wanted, yeah. to bringing people closer together, which yeah. is more about um, connecting us to each other. And then, empathy. What? Empathy, warmth. Empathy, warmth. But that has a whole other layer to it, which people just are not talking about, which is that in order to create this empathy uh, across uh, different cultures and understandings and political views. Genders, races. Genders, races. Facebook wants to bring people into your life that you wouldn't know in your day to day. They want to break the echo chamber that has increased engagement. Well, they want to... So Zuckerberg was meeting uh, in Dayton, Ohio with some uh, drug addicts and they told him that it would have been easier for them to recover if they had had more non-addict friends. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so Zuckerberg took that experience and then another experience he had at a detention center and said, well, what if we could introduce people to people they should know, not just the people you may know on Facebook, the people you should know. Yeah. And that's a that's an interesting solution, but what it requires is an extremely intimate knowledge of your life, not just your life, but your problems and mm-hmm. what you need. Um, and it's it's like sort of crafting your the future of your social life. It's very it's getting back to that precog. Like we know what you need mm-hmm. that you don't know you need. And think of right. the presumptiveness required to believe that Facebook has the power to offer that solution in your life. Yeah, that it's okay for them to get all of that information because they have the power to like make you a not a drug and addict. Personal coach is like Molly. This is, these are the problems with you, and here are the people that you should hang out with to make well, no, you a better person. Even more than that, I'm the one who can fix it. I, yeah. I mean, this is literally Mark Zuckerberg saying, "I and Facebook are the ones who can fix all of this," yeah. and that is a kind of a scary, megalom- you know, megalomaniacal viewpoint to be coming when you really break it down the presumptiveness that's just to say <laughs> that um okay that facebook the the intricacy with which they understand their users lives they're hoping to get a lot more in depth of it that the, mm-hmm. that the the kind of integration of facebook we've seen into our lives is only going to get more so as they introduce something like like uh, my colleague Mark and I reported earlier this year that they're coming out with a video chat device for your home that will also have personal assistant attributes um, that they're going to try to, to oh introduce next year. Um, a lot of people I've talked to said that said they could not imagine having Facebook in their house. In their house. No way. Right, you you would be. It, they're asking for people's credit, and when you see um when you see the the donation options on Facebook right now, it's a very big initiative. You know, yeah. donate it's donate to the Red Cross, Patreon, to, yeah. then then now Facebook has your credit card number, and in the Too future powerful, it'll yeah. it'll make it easier for you to make purchases through your business spots on Messenger or on Marketplace. Right, this this is all becoming a like you said, every aspect of your life. Um, and all the companies want to do this, by the way. Yeah. So it's not just Facebook, no, but they want to. to understand all the points at which they can interact with you and then ultimately build up their artificial intelligence c- capabilities. So I guess yeah. to answer your question, I, I'm not sure what the regulation response is to this, um, but I Should do there th- just be one? Should I, there be I some do, regulation? I do think that, that Facebook is getting a lot more, uh, has plans to get even more involved in the fabric of society than we've currently seen. Sounds like you're leaning towards yes. I don't know what that would look like. I mean, I... Uh, Regulation as in we are going to... um, You cannot target people based on gender slash race anymore. I don't think that's the the regulation I'm talking about. What regulation do you think? I mean, that's just like an example, but some sort of regulation. So there's a couple questions. One is, do is there a point at which Facebook crosses over from a regular company to something like a Comcast, where it's an actual utility provider? Right. You know, where it is a where we, where you can make argument. right, and and it's not. Well, this is a weird position to be in at this exact He's moment. He's not wrong. He's not totally wrong on that. No, I mean, there's an argument. You know, and Facebook's goal is His to essentially horrible, Facebook's goal is essentially to supplant the World Wide Web, right? To be the access yeah. point for our networked lives. Um, and so that's a reasonable conversation to have is that is that now there's a layer of regulation that could exist in this country to protect us that would affect Facebook, like right. data gathering and, and storage requirements, which we currently do not have on the federal they level. They shouldn't be able to hold any, this is what I think. I'm going to sum it up here so we can move on to the yeah, next horrible totally. story of, <laughs> in this week in horrible tech behavior. Um, all right, Jason's law. Number one, any dark ads, any, all ads on Facebook must be transparent and must be publicly listed at ads.facebook.com. And they, all ads that you see uh, must have underneath them, this ad was targeted at, and the five ways they were targeted. So underneath it, in light gray, this ad was targeted at women in Florida between the ages of 18 and 25. 
If you're going to target me, I deserve to know. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, all ads, all ad copy must be stored and shared and freely available to anybody in a searchable database. So if I want to see ads targeted at African Americans in a swing state, I can just type African Americans aged 35 to 60 with college degrees and show me all the ads that were done. This all ads. National, this would be. This could be a requirement for everything. I mean, this. I, I could see this applied broadly, being yes, freaking great Jason's for the online advertising law. industry. This would be Jason's <laughs> bill. Finally, I get a bill in Congress. Do it. Do it. So all dark ads have to be listed. All targeting has to be listed underneath the ad. Mm -hmm. Cannot be hidden anywhere else. And um, here's the other shoe that's going to drop. I'm going to give two more shoes that can be dropped. By the way, you two guys have been great uh, guests today. Like, really good guests. Like, knowledge plus opinion. I love it. Uh, so let me just once again thank Molly Wood, at Molly Wood, uh, on Twitter, and Sarah Fryer, S-A-R-A-H-F-R-I-E-R, -E from At Business, also known as Bloomberg News. Here are two shoes that are going to drop. You guys can take these and run with them if you're so inclined. Number one, Facebook may or may not be in a lawsuit with people who used Facebook Connect to grow their startup, who were then baited and switched and kicked off of the Facebook Connect platform after their data was studied and the features of their product and the granularity in which they studied user behavior were used to create a competing Facebook product. In other words, when Paul Graham invited Facebook to come to Y Combinator a couple years back, and I said, anybody who is a startup who allows Facebook to come to their incubator is out of their fucking mind. Uh, sorry, Jimmy Carson, fracking. Bleep that out, please. Uh, 65 minutes in, first F-bomb. If they did that, and they bait and switched people, number one, bad on you for being a founder who's so naive that you would let the fox into the hen house. But essentially what's happened now is the fox has carried the hen house into the fox den. They literally convinced the world to use Facebook Connect, studied the data of their own partners, and then used granular data from users to kill those companies by targeting ads to their own users. A company called House Party you may have heard of had this done to them and caught Facebook doing it. What if... This was an explicit program. In other words, Facebook said from the beginning, let's let these idiots use Facebook Connect to have access to the social graph, study them and kill them and incorporate their features, which has now happened to Snapchat. It happened to one of my investments, Gowalla, and Dave Moran's Path, and many, many others. That's shoe number one. You guys can take that and run with that if you want, or if there's other journalists listening. I'm not saying that I have any inside information. I'm not saying I don't have inside information, but what if? That's a what if. I'm pretty good at the disclaimers. What if this happened? Many people are saying. Many, people are saying. Many people are saying. <laughs> Many people could be saying. Many people Even better. might have said. <laughs> people might have speculated that people said. I, I can triple up these uh, disclaimers. All right, here's your second one. What if... The Russians stole, not, not broke into voting machines, pretty hard to do. I mean, you could try, but you're only going to hit like whatever number of places, right? They obviously try, but it's fragmented. So that's kind of a good thing. You know, there's no single point of failure in the voting system because everybody does it differently. Some people are punching chads. Other people are f mailing things in. It's kind of hard. There's no single point of failure. But what if they stole democratic... They got Hillary's emails. But what if they had all the Democratic donors? What if they had all the Democratic voters? What if they had all the data from the DNC? Or from other voting rolls, even, of who voted for who? What if they took that data, and there was some incredibly powerful company that understood how Facebook worked? And what if the person who was on the board of Facebook was a Trump supporter who had given him millions of dollars and ran a company that provides intelligence to the United States government called Palantir 
And then that money was then used by the company that that person is on the board of to spend the ads that we were talking about earlier. What if the Russians hacked the demographics, the demographics were correlated by some clever company we had all never heard about before this called Cambrian Analytica? What if that hacked data was then used money that Peter Thiel got from investing in Facebook, and Peter Thiel intimately knows how Facebook works, and Cambrian Analytica, and maybe Palantir even, were involved somehow in this. What if those things happened? Some people have told me that other people may have discussed other people speculating about this. <laughs> it sounds like a conspiracy theory, doesn't it? Uh-huh. But as we're seeing, as the cards turn over, conspiracy theories are just facts that have yet to be uncovered in some cases. I've heard other people say that. On The X-Files, it was a great TV show. You should go check it out. It was incredible. <laughs> All right. That was mesmerizing. I mean, I was mesmerized. I don't think I was breathing the whole time. Just, <laughs> I like, want to know what, what's next. So listen, I'm not a journalist anymore, nor do I have the time to be an investigative journalist, which mm -hmm. means I am privy to a lot of inside information. Right. No inside information was used in what I just discussed. I had something in my eye. Just, <laughs> something in my eye. The makeup got in my eye. However, these could be things that could have occurred, maybe, possibly, who knows. The possibilities All right. are endless. <laughs> the possibilities, in fact, are endless. Let's check. <laughs> the 500. I nothing, man. <laughs> I just, hey, Nestle bought Blue Let's Bottle. Let's do the numbers. Let's do the numbers. Nestle has bought Blue Bottle for $700 million. Anybody care? Except hipsters here? Yeah, yeah, I only care in the like, oh, another craft beer maker goes down kind of way. Yeah, it's like that. Yep. I mean, Blue Bottle was already pretty, pretty, pretty expansive. Mm -hmm. uh, good job, good job, Chris Michael. Yeah, good know. job. You know, I know Ag Eye. I know Tony Conrad invested a ton of money from True Ventures in this, got laughed at by every other venture capitalist for investing in a coffee, in company. A coffee company. They were like, you dope. I mean, Blue Bottle did everything right. If you really look at it, they really, it was just Honestly, brilliant marketing. It was actually good coffee. Like, the coffee is know, good. Coffee's good. I get those beans. You open that pack, that 12-ounce pack yeah. that you paid equivalently 30 ounces for. I'm all about the New Orleans iced. Oh, it's ridiculous with the chicory. It's just those good. little like special, mm -hmm. just Honestly, special here, things. I, let me give you a pro tip. Pro yeah. tip coming up. Okay, lay it on me. The original chicory coffee is from Café du Monde. Yeah, of course. Pull up a picture of the Café du Monde in the can on, uh, on Amazon, please. I'm your watering producer, Jackie. Throw that up on the screen. Café du Monde comes in cans. It's chicory coffee. The New Orleans coffee is just chicory. Yeah. Chicory is bark. Bark, in the Civil War, they used to put bark into the coffee to make the coffee last twice as long. People got addicted to the flavor of it. I'm addicted to it. So now I make... Café du Monde, in this little bottle here, $6.70 for a pound. You know why it's so cheap per pound? Because half of it's bark. <laughs> so they're selling you for four fifty eight eight ounces. The goddamn pound costs less than the one cup you buy. See? They did Listen to J-Cal. Right. Go now, everybody. I'm not sponsored by Café du Monde. If they would like to buy a 10 ad run, I will sell so much Café du Monde the world has never seen. <laughs> it's going to be huge, all right? Café du Monde is amazing. Amazing coffee. It's greatest. Hard working. Oh, and then I can have New Orleans ice at home. And you make it, and no, you drink it warm. And then whatever you don't drink, you put it in the refrigerator, yep. you put two cups of sugar, you put two spoonfuls of sugar, you put a little heavy cream in it, and now you've got the same exact thing. That's what I do. I save my money. I'm cheap. Uh, sorry, you talked a little bit about influencers and how social media companies are making money off them or don't. Mm -hmm. Explain to us all what's happening on Instagram because people are advertising seven things at once. There's a whole new category of Insta models and Insta celebrities. But Instagram supposedly now is on to this and de-prioritizing, ghosting people who put ads in it. What's no, going on? No, 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 no. This is the rumor I'm hearing. <laughs> this could be haters. That would be amazing, but no. No. They're not uh, ghosting people who no. are hiding ads. Instagram is great at influencers. Right. Um, the, the story I wrote was about how influencers on Snap mm -hmm. are finding it very difficult to make money off being influencers on Snap. So basically how the influencer economy works is, um, you know, 
Molly's really great at fashion. She posts, posts an outfit of the day every day and people follow her because they want really want to know what she recommends. And then every once in a while, she'll like tag a brand or she'll do a sponsored video with a certain makeup company and she'll make money off those posts. And what Instagram has done is they, is they sort of legitimize this economy last year and they said okay we know that this is happening whether we like it or not right what you can do brand is you can link up with this influencer post and get the analytics on it and promote it in your own feed if you want to and you know generally make this in- influencer marketing more valuable what snap has said is well, that's not what we're for right um and so people who post uh, their campaigns on Snap, if they want to make money off of them, yeah. um, it's hard. You know, it, it's hard. I talked to one influencer who takes a screenshot of the people who watched his Snap story at the 23 hour and 59 minute mark. So he gets the the people that he can report back to the brand. Yeah, it, that's the data. You know, what it's they not do they the demographic a- information. Yeah. It's not any of the other stuff. So, so. And a lot of people have said, well, Sarah, that doesn't really matter because it's not really the sure companies making money off these ads. It's the, it's the um, influencers. influencers. Right. But Instagram has found a way to legitimize this business, as I said, and Snap could do the same. Except for Snap is very, um, there's a lot of intention around the product and in what it should be or what it stands for. Uh, Evan has a position. He has a position. Yeah. This is a place for your intimate relationships, intimate friendships, um, where you can be silly. It's not for your latte art. It's not for your avocado toast, for your for Molly's outfit of the day. It's Sorry, not for Molly. your flat belly tea. It's, it's, I keep drinking that flat belly tea. It's not, it's not working, <laughs> apparently. I got a bad batch. Yeah, so, so it, it's a little bit of a philosophy issue. Yeah. And, um, Fascinating. Hmm. Is the, does the philosophy include ever making money? Snap. Well, Snap yeah. wants to make money in Snap. the in the way that is true to their creative yeah. values, yeah. right? Yeah, how's that working out for them? Um, this is why Facebook saying, shareholders Facebook want the over mar- the world. There's a reason. Yeah, because they're more about dog in the window, Same with by Apple. the way. I feel like we should, <gasps> we should say hi. Oh, my God. Hi, hi dog. <laughs> Oh my god! Whoa, there whoa, is like whoa, literally whoa. a puppy. Behind Shut it me. down. <laughs> we have to go. Just we have to go say, right now. Breaking news: that. There is a baby a German Shepherd puppy in my drive. Right um, I would like to go now. Hey, moving on. Wrap. Uh, wrap. We're gonna wrap in a minute. <laughs> Bodega is a new startup by two ex Googlers, and uh, essentially, it's a little. Ve- it's a vending machine. Yeah. That's like a hipster vending machine. It's yep. like uh, it looks like fancy. a fancy. It looks like a cabinet. It's about waist height. It's glass front door, and you got everything you need in there. If you need a little shaving gel or yeah, whatever you need, you need some Advil. I guess you put money in and you take it, and you're good. Mm-hmm. They called it Bodega. Now I looked up in the Snowflake Manual, cultural appropriation, <laughs> and clearly Bodega. <laughs> yeah, well, they what? even use the cat. What's wrong with I don't understand what what, what is the cat's The rep- cat is like what the cat is how you know that it is a full on appropriation of the actual Bronx bodega culture because part of the bodega culture is that there's always a bodega cat. There's like a cat. A cat that, in the bodega. A cat in the bodega to, that to there's get like rid of the mice. It's even in Spider-Man. It's even in the latest Spider-Man movie. Yes. There's no, a cat I in the bodega in, that he goes to. Like it's a But thing. hold on a second. Bodega's a generic term that nobody owns for a convenience store. Mm-hmm. So if I named my startup Convenient Store, or just Convenient, mm-hmm. or Convenience. It wouldn't have had the same effect. It would have zero effect. Right. But if I say Bodega, it's cultural appropriation. That's what we all commonly call. It's not a, I it's don't think it's a, a cultural appropriation thing. Well, so it's, it's just one of those sensitive? like, oh, that's so, that's so nice of you to try to put a bunch of bodegas out of business with this, your fancy startup called Bodega. But it's not going to put bodegas out of business. It's not going to have any impact on them. These are just going to go into what, like hotel lobbies and stuff? Really? Where are they putting the, them? They want to put them everywhere, right? In oh. dorms, yeah, and they want to put them in the to be an apartment building. An apartment and building. So then you don't have to leave your apartment and go to the corner bodega because there's one in the lobby. But there's already vending machines there, so how is this much different? It's very uh, similar, pe- okay, very hold on similar a to a vending machine, except with all the stuff that you would otherwise buy at the corner store. Okay, I mean you have to you so have there's to two admit issues. that a, a self-service, yes. essentially automated corner store 
could have an impact. I mean, you know, on just based other, on the Amazon effect, I think yeah. we could see that there could be a trickle down but it, situation but it's not for corner replace stores. The cat or the owner who knows. Uh, you know, he what can, cigarettes you buy? Yeah, exactly. Or you can right. hold your keys for the guest out of town. It, it, That's what they said about Barnes and Noble too. It's not going to replace the bookseller who knows everything right. and can tell you. Yeah, how that out. I'm <laughs> just saying. Let me tell you something. When I see a book with like 94 percent five star reviews, interaction, like please. angelthebook.com. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, I think that the the name the name had an emotional attachment. Trigger. To it triggered people is what so. you're saying? The, there's so much triggering right now that people are pretty fired up. And then bodegas are also, I mean, you know, uh, I, you know what? I just don't even want to go down this line because I'm just going to get myself in trouble. But the the Bronx bodega culture is, you know, a cult, is, is we had a very, it's too. very multicultural, I mean, right? So you're basically saying, okay, we're going to go into these really multi, we're going to take this beloved thing in neighborhoods of color and we're going to appropriate mm-hmm. it because we're two white Google guys and then we're even right. going to use the cat and then we're going to make it a mini. It was basically just as tone deaf as it gets is all it's it is. To- it's a little tone deaf. It's, it's just yeah, idiotic. It's just tone deaf. It's just tone deaf. But it's exactly now, when, look, they're not even both second, white. Like I totally assumed, Indian, I know. Like. I made all the assumptions. All right, if it was two Hispanic founders, two female Hispanic founders who came up with this idea, from the Bronx, would they have faced this backlash or not? Not the same way, no. No. Because I, I think the it would have been no. rolled out differently. It would have been marketed differently. I mean, that, you know, yeah. it's it's because there's guys, a backlash they, they already. they haven't lived in, in mm. New York, it's... And not that bodegas are only a thing in New York. They're big right. in L.A. too. Right. Um, I wish we had more bodegas here in San Francisco. Can you imagine if Wikipedia or Wikia launched today? The, it would... This, literally, they would be like... You're culturally appropriating wiki, which means fast in Hawaiian. Or if I had launched Mahalo today, it would be like, you're culturally appropriating the Hawaiian culture by using the word thank you. But Wikipedia's goal is to I feel like you're, share information. I mean, yeah. it's not like... It's not taking anything away from... I don't think... Yeah, I think that you're coming close to saying that this is a little bit of PC run amok, but what it really is is a thing that touches on a whole bunch of things that are really raw in America right now. Automation, you know, yeah, marginalization. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's just a perfect storm a perfect of storm. poorly done marketing. Right. But so I don't I think this is the intent a, of the person. Like, I, I just watched the backlash. I caught the back end of it, and I just thought... God, this poor intent is questionable because it's so influenced by privilege, though. That's the point. Hold on a second. That I got, you got to unpack that for me. You can say that they intended that. You can say that Mark Zuckerberg never. It never occurred to him. He intended for Facebook to be a platform that would be used for good because his okay. life is so easy and delightful that nothing bad has ever happened to him. Intent come to intent is informed by your own experience, and if okay. your own experience is sheltered and comes out of the idea that computers do everything better than people, mm-hmm. you know then your intent is is inherently actually untrustworthy. What, is this, what happens to this company now, do you think? If you, if you go through this kind of, like, they were the rage, the outrage of the day or two, yeah. does the company have to fold? Does the company have to move on? Oh, I, I, just change I, the I name. change the name and you're it. good? Or maybe they won't change the name because now they've gotten all this press about their product and everyone knows what it is. Totally. And, Recognition can't be bad for a new startup. I mean, you can look at it however cynically you want to look at it. Um, right. Everybody's going to use it. I mean, the reason it's so, I think the reason people got so upset is because it would totally work. Everyone would use it. Right. If it didn't make any sense, if they were like, we're going to make. It's a, it's a big logistics problem. Right. The business, the underlying business model may not be good. Yeah. It's a, it's a ton of product. It's a ton of SKUs. It's like actually being in some sort of retail. Guys. It's a glass front. It's going to get smashed. I mean, it's, you know, there's a million. Here's a good idea. Other questions. Yes. Go to the existing bodegas, because a lot of them close. They're not all 24 hours. And say, we will build into the side of the store the bodega unit. So when it's, mid, when it's 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. and you're not open, People can come and buy stuff and make the bodegas partners in bodega and give them a couple of shares. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. That's it, huh? We can all get along. You've had two really good laws today, I have to say, because sometimes you put down your law and I'm like, oh, sweet Jesus, the unintended consequences are just crushing me like an anvil. <laughs> yeah. But today you're crushing it. I'm on Not today. in a bad way. In Not a in way. a bad way. Yep. Well, listen, you know, I'm always trying to spitball stuff and solve a problem mm-hmm. here or there. And uh, sometimes Doing you, great. Doing sometimes great, kid. you Put the flag up the pole, people salute. Other times you put the toast in the oven, you burn it. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> that was folksy. I don't that know was like Dan Rather folksy. 
It is a little damn round, yeah. folks. I'm working on my marriage like hasten approach. I'm trying to be able to speak mm -hmm. extensive. I'm trying to build bridges. That's like everything I do now is try to like take an outrageous thing that happened instead of taking one side or the other. Try to build a bridge in yeah, which we can build all... build any bridges with Mark Zuckerberg Bridges, today, not think. walls. That's no, because you know what? I can't be building bridges with Mark Zuckerberg because I think we're going to be head-to-head -head in a debate at some point. So I have to start laying the groundwork right now. Because I'm gonna, he's gonna go for president. He's not gonna get it. I'm gonna go for mayor. I got a pretty good shot. I think I got a better shot at mayor than he's got a president. If he goes for governor, I think he gets it. You think he wins governor, California? No, no. He can't win anything. What What would his incentive be to run for governor? I mean, he's got so much more power currently than he'd ever have in that kind of a role. Oh, Sarah, really? Don't you understand? All those Silicon Psyche? Valley guys secretly want to be in government. Don't you understand? Yeah. Like, there's <laughs> never enough power. There's never enough. Look at Trump. The guy's going to be dead in the next 10 years. He, what is he, 75? 74? No, he's 70. No, or he's older than 70. Oh. I mean, the guy looks terrible. He, he's like, somebody look up the age of Trump. I think it's 73. He looks like he's <laughs> I am 96. Looking, back there. But anyway, he, he's over 70. Yeah. 71. 71. That means... I think I win. I what is the average uh -huh. age a human... You win. You, average age a male in the United States lives is what? 74? 75? And he's a fat bastard. I mean, he looks terrible. That guy is so out of shape. I don't know if you saw those pictures of him playing golf. It looked yeah. like Jabba the Hutt. I mean, he looks terrible. And he eats horribly. He's got five to ten years left. To take the position of president of the United States, the most stressful position in the world, for the last eight years of your life, instead of enjoying your private chat, this shows you the male psyche. Mm -hmm. Only a demented, deranged, egomaniacal, megalomaniac, megalomaniac mm -hmm. would say, I'm going to sacrifice the last eight years just so that when I'm dead, people can say I was president. Because yep. by the way, when you're dead, you don't get to hear them say that. You know, it's just, this is how men I think. I mean, Zuck has all the signs. He for sure has all the signs of somebody who is going to try to make that run. I have a 76. really hard time believing that's going to work. Just here's the good news for the people who are anti-Trump. And I don't mean to be morbid, but the average lifespan of a, of a male in the U.S. is 76.7 years. So he's got arguably five years left. It's pretty low. And under this stress, but then again, somebody told me his parents lived forever. They were like in their 90s or something. Uh, all right. Listen, we could sit here and talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> this has been absolutely We correct. have, in fact. And in fact, we have. <laughs> uh, we're going to take a bio break and be back for hours three and four of this week <laughs> in startups. Uh, but I will wrap it. At, uh, uh, is there anything else that we missed this week you guys wanted to comment on? Anything major? Who's got a plug? We hit plug? the big ones. We hit the big ones, we for big sure. Ones. I'm going to plug my new show. I mean. Yes. Let's plug this. Let's uh, do it. Uh, Molly is now the head. It's only two, my second week. I need like a, what do they call that? T Timphony? Timphony? When they... Do that brrr, oh, yeah. brrr, announcement. Go ahead. You're now. Tech. I am now the host of Marketplace Tech, which is a, a week every weekday uh, technology-based broadcast distributed nationally. We just picked up Seattle and uh, Pittsburgh in and my, it, in my two, first two weeks as, as host. Podcast as well. And you can get it as a podcast, which is what the part I'm going to plug. Which is I really it's want. Um, I really want to take down Reply All in the iTunes ratings just for like a day. So if you <laughs> could just go ahead and let's subscribe to Marketplace Tech. Please. Right, hey, if you really and leave a review because that's like please. the key. You got to leave the review. Key. I know. So if you could just, if I could just have my one day in the sun where I'm ahead of Reply All because I've been stuck at three. I'll give you. A I'm not even like I, I don't have no. I have Here's no illusions tip. about Ted. I'm not taking them down. Get an email newsletter going. Oh yes. And then ask me about Project SR and Project SM. Like you know, it's good when he like leans in and I can't, kind of I can't, I can't say <laughs> it on the air. Later. But I have two little secret weapons for you: Project SR, Project SM. All right, we'll done. talk after. Right. This is gonna move you up the rankings. But yeah, go subscribe. And one of the things I'm excited about, one of our reporting streams, I think that you'll be into, is something I'm calling evenly distributed, where we are actually looking at the profound impact. And my first guest on that topic was William Gibson, who kept coined that phrase. What? Um, yeah. Oh yeah. It uh, was. You had William Gibson on? Yeah. Oh, I, I had kind of a baller first week launch. I'm not going to lie. We had a Jeet Pie, William Gibson, that. Steve That's Jervitson. Awesome. Like it was a good. I but, listened to the Steve Jervitson one. That was great. You know, I'm so. I had to slow. This is the first time I took a podcast from 1.5 down to 0.5. Because he talks at two. 
He talks at 2.5. Yeah. He, I am he so was candid. proud of that. He was really candid, and he has since kept a whole conversation about diversity going on his Facebook page. And he Facebook friended me, which I thought was a little, I was like, oh, Steve's we're, a good no, we're homies. I mean, it's totally fine. I, like, no, no, he's normally I don't do that because I have a public Steve's one my, and a private Steve, one, but Steve's I was like, all right, yeah, we could be homies. Like, Steve's my homie. He's a good, he's good people. He's a good person. He's, he's, a, he's um, a legitimate good person. But yes, it's very exciting. Anyway, the future is here. It's just not very evenly distributed. So we yep. have a story this week about uh, an app that lets people check their food stamp balance on their smartphone because apparently that didn't exist, which is crazy. And we have a real human from the Bronx. Wait a second. A he real human. Like shopping in a bodega. <laughs> what ha- wait, wait, your food stamps, you can't do what? You could not check your food stamp balance on, a, on an app, on a phone. You would have to call and enter in like a 16-digit pin wow. that most people would just have to commit to memory. And it's like a multiple prompt situation. And so we interviewed this so, woman who's like, if I don't want to go through that and I'm in line, you know, sometimes I don't get all the way through the process before I have to check out. And then I come up short and I have to put groceries back. And it's, a, it's like yeah. the most non-technical. And so we interviewed this guy who used to work at Facebook. And quit to try to build apps to solve social problems because right, his family used to be on food stamps. I gave you guys two ideas that I thought were pretty good. Jason's Law for the transparency on the ads. I love that ad transparency thing. That yeah. is L- hey, genius. have me on Marketplace next week. We'll do it. Totes, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> let's plan. Totes do that. That'd In be good. Bodega. You should come on Make Me Smart. That'd be good. Uh, Cross promo. You're saying it, it will make me smart? <laughs> or do you have <laughs> no, people you on there? Come oh, to help smart. other people get smart? Yeah, yeah. Oh, all right. Well, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> the, here's my... Uh, Oh, God, I forgot my third idea. Anyway, follow uh, William Gibson. He's great dismal on uh, on the Twitter. He's good He's good on Twitter. He's so brilliant. He's so brilliant. He's a brilliant We cat. put up the full 45-minute interview. We called it the source code. It's, it's very so you can, good. If you got nothing but time. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get this wrapped up here. Yes, sorry. Sarah, I'll give you A+, plus, by the way, for your first uh, appearance. You Thank you very good. much. You did very good. How old are you, and uh, how long have you been a reporter? I'm just how old am I? I just, oh, this weekend will turn 28. 28. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. So you've been reporting for what? Six years? Seven years? How long have you been a journalist? Yeah, yeah. And you had Bloomberg for how Bloomberg many Bloomberg the whole time. The whole time? Mm-hmm. Wow. Very nice. Not including, like, internships, but. Uh-huh. Where'd you, where'd you go to school? UNC Chapel Hill. Very good. All right. Go Heels. Um, we should have turned to you for all that Southern accent stuff that we were doing. <laughs> yeah, you could have gotten us going. Well, I'm from that. California. I mean, I'm sure you must have internalized a little bit of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can do a good I can do a good ass tea. <laughs> um, listen, Bloomberg's got a great group of reporters over there. Obviously, Eric's over there Such doing a, a great work. job. Mm-hmm. Um, although, he just, how does he get into the board? How does Eric, Kara... Mike. And Mike all fit into the air ducts at the Uber board meetings. Like, how big is the air duct <laughs> at the Four Seasons? Like, or I'm just are, imagining them all. Like, no, you just, here's totally what I imagine. I imagine the three of them, literally in Four Seasons room service uniforms, bringing in the water bottles and the pens and the papers and like slowly like all three, all three of those guys we're just putting are, these are water bottles here for you and <laughs> oh, let me can we clear your plates and they're just like what <laughs> uh, they're doing a bang up job over there everybody follow at business it's nice to work at Bloomberg huh you got that nice office over there it's gorgeous we've Free got food. a great team lots of scoops doing pretty good who is the woman uh, who we had on the program who just destroyed Har- Hampton Creek for their Olivia Zaleski. Olivia. She's great. We had she's her on the program, ass. too. Mm-hmm. And she barbecue sauced. Uh, we call it getting barbecued in the biz. Mm-hmm. She got barbecue sauced. Uh, ha- ha- Hampton Creek got barbecued. Their whole board quit on Moss. And then Juicero. Juicero was Ellen Hewitt. Yeah. Ellen Hewitt. Yeah. Wow, nice, nice job over there. Why, why is it that Bloomberg is doing so well? Do they, do they give you time to report? Is that the issue? They the give goal you time? is scoops. We're trying to So no more trying to keep value. up with like the tech meme, blah, 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 with like. Oh, I mean, we, we do the basic stuff too, but the, the goal is to tell people things they don't already know. I like it. You guys are doing real well. I mean, this investigative journalism thing is really keeping people on their toes. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's, we got a good adversarial some, I think sometimes the rage stuff where like Bodega gets destroyed like for being clueless, I, I'm, I, that worries me a bit because I, I hate when you take somebody's intent, which was good, 
but cluelessness, and then you make it very personal, which it gets very personal on Twitter. It's kind of a meme. Yeah. The outrage machine thing is. I it's mean, just a little cruel to people. Like, new. I think people kill themselves over this. Like, maybe not adults, but kids for sure do. So I just think we as a society have to start mitigating against that a bit. Mm-hmm. But I do like the fact that the bullshit meter and journalists are no longer taking the tech crunch, high five culture of like, everything's great and there was a press release about Google buying a company, and so that has to be true because it was on PR web where anybody can post anything for 50 bucks and we'll just run it without ever calling Google. Now you have a whole, it's all bifurcating. You have like TechCrunch doing no original reporting, and just rehashing shit, and then you have you guys like actually doing real calling people on the phone. It's good. It's good for the ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, you should tell the ecosystem. You should totally tell them. You know what? I honestly think it's all going to balance itself out because, you know, ha- having been on both sides of the table, you know, I was a journalist for 10, 15 years on my own magazine and then an investor for five or six. Having seen both sides, there's a group of people who deserve to get knocked on their ass for doing stupid shit and behaving in an inappropriate manner. And it should be fact based. And it, you know, just, we just got to keep it classy. Like, it, it shouldn't get into people's personal lives. I mean, unless there's something. That is personal we in the didn't workplace. Talk about SoFi on this. We, yeah, we missed that one. I mean, I mean, well, what more do you need to know? The Art guy was dating his yeah. assistant and sending lurid texts to people. It's textbook. Another. Story. It's, ta- it's another textbook example of like, don't date at work. Don't date at work. This is a very simple concept. We've gone through three generation, three generational changes. When Molly and I were coming up in the industry. People fraternized at work. Mm -hmm. That was kind of expected. Mm -hmm. Now, in your generation, they explicitly tell you, do not fraternize at work, correct? Like, don't date your subjects. Don't date anybody at work. They they tell you this, correct, in HR? Oh, yeah. Right. When we were like, do they? I'm God, curious. So. I'm pretty yeah, sure no, they I'm do. Curious, you know, but I don't if, know. You, if you have a relationship, you have to disclose it, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I don't fully remember the policy, but, but yeah, I'm no, pretty sure I'm, I'm due for another one of the compliance sessions. training sessions. And The sessions when we used to go to them, correct me if I'm wrong, Molly, were a chance to joke about how absurd the training was. And people were just kind of goofing off at it. And it was kind of like a checkbox that I went to training. And people were dating at work. In fact... The generation before us, boomers, were ter- told to go to work explicitly to find a spouse. Mm-hmm. And many of our parents... People are still dating at work, though. Come on. They still do, we but... put a bunch it, of 20-somethings in an office together. What are they They should not. Do? They should not. And How I was watching not Insecure. To? It's okay if they date if they're, if they're peers. It's still not okay. I'll tell you why. They just have to disclose it. It should, still shouldn't do it. I was watching... Inse- you guys watch Insecure? HBO? Oh, Yes. Mm-hmm. This is I haven't a watched really it yet, good but it's show. like it's on my as soon as I get through this other thing uh-huh. list, you know. Like, yes. No, Insecure is amazing. Mm-hmm. It's like it's sort of like girls, but it's urban. Yeah, uh, and it's in L.A. in Inglewood, where I used to go play poker at Hollywood Park. So I kind of I've interest- seen almost every single actor from Insecure on Jesus and Mero, so I feel like I watch it, even though I don't. Yeah, watch I watch them all. In the I'm breakfast up on the club, plot, but so like they're all on, they're always on the Breakfast Club, and you get to watch them there. But it, it's very interesting because they have a theme in it of an African American. Uh, one of the leads goes to work at a white tech company in Santa Monica at the winter, which is apparently at the Winter Garden, which is where all the tech companies are. Mm. And it's a really interesting, like his experience at the white bro culture thing. It's, it's important for people to watch. Mm. Um, anyway, but anyway, they're all date dating at work. At I didn't work. mean to say it's like okay. They're don't all date dating at work. at work, and it. Uh, I can tell you, inevitably, it's it? go- it's going it's to end in good. tears. Do not date at work. You have Tinder now. You have Match.com. We didn't have this. Yeah. You had no choice. You met people at work, or you, and that's it. Or at the gym or the dog park. Let me tell you something. There's a, I got a long... There was just a whole study, actually, about how none of that works. The Match.com and the Tinder, like the rates, are, it was basically like, you have just as good of odds at, at the... As, uh, you have just as good of odds at the dog park as you do on Tinder, because, yeah, it's right. just more fun. For sure, the dog park in New York was popping. That yeah. was, like, better than going to Palladium. Put all the makeup on. Yeah, you got, you. you got to be like, you got to look good, but be casual. Right. In New York, we called it uglying up. I had a model friend who, uglying she was up. so stunning that she literally uglied up to go out. So she would wear, when she went to walk her dog, like 
you know, hair would be messy, baseball cap, wear like ill-fitting clothes, just so that she would be less catcalled. That's exactly why I look street. like this right now, by the way. Just what you just said. Just to just lower the catcalls. All right, listen, everybody. Uh, thanks again to Molly Wood. Follow her at Molly Wood. Go ahead and subscribe and rate and write a review. Do it. Of Marketplace Tech. She is the new host, and she is awesome. And if you haven't listened to the Steve Jurvetson episode, it was particularly good. And they got, they, you know, they, you guys went through the landmine and, and uh, went through the minefield. And it, I think it was a positive discussion. Sarah Fryer is Sarah Fryer on the Twitter. Follow at business, which is Bloomberg's, it's confusing, but that's Bloomberg's handle. If you type at Bloomberg, do you get Mike Bloomberg? or No, he's Mike Bloomberg, I think. Uh, yeah, and they have this know. incredible office. You might own that one too. Free food. Got to be careful working over there. I, I was just on Bloomberg Radio in New York and like on the way out, I literally took eight items. You get the coconut chips, the brownie bites. I was over, I, I was literally like going station to station. It was like I was at Whole Foods. <laughs> it was literally like my visit to Bloomberg. They're like, check Jason off the list. <laughs> no, like I go to CNBC, I go to CNBC and they're like, oh yeah, we got like the, uh, would you like a coffee? I'm like, yeah, and? Then I go to Bloomberg and they're like, Froyo. Juice. Ooh, we don't have Froyo, but in New York they got a Froyo machine. They do now. Yeah, oh, man. I they don't care. In 2013, so they don't. They do not change. care. You're about. like, we don't have any Froyo. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hey, thanks to my friends at Twitter for allowing us to try the Twitter live streaming platform. Worked great, and looks like we had 200 to 300 people on it. So that was uh, very nice of them. Well done, uh, at Jack. Uh, by the way, my name's at Jason. We've met like 18 times. Last time we met, you didn't know who I was. Maybe he was a little drunk. This is no, he wasn't. <laughs> Just starting rumors. No, no. <laughs> it was a uh, high. This is like I had this great moment. I was like literally coming out of my hotel in LA, and I'm at the valet waiting for an Uber, and I look over and I'm like literally standing six inches away from Evan Spiegel. So I'm like, "Oh, Evan, how you doing? Hey, how's it going?" Da da da. Blah blah blah. I start talking to him, and I realize he doesn't know who I am. I said, oh, I'm Jason Calacanis. We have these three friends. Da, 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 da. And he's like, oh, okay, that's great. I'm just, you know, whatever. No idea. He's so out of Silicon Valley culture. Like, he's like, does not care about Silicon Valley culture at all. That company is getting murdered, huh? I, I'm not saying anything because we're just about to start a whole other. I think I heard Jackie just be like, stop the show. Stop that. No, they're seriously like, getting not, murdered. I, I know, mean, because well, he doesn't seem to also care about making any money. I don't and know Facebook is just like, let's just steal everything. Yeah. I mean, talk about headwinds. My God, it's like, it's literally like he's Cersei and like he's up against like Mark Zuckerberg and Three Dragons. It's like Drakaris. <laughs> Facebook is just like, <laughs> five Tricaras. All right, well, uh, thanks again to uh, Scott Walker and the Walker Corporate Law Group, and of course, WordPress, Matt Mullenweg, my pal. Thanks for supporting Independent Media like this week in startups, and thank you, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie, four Emmys and counting. Uh, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye bye. <laughs>